Hi, I'm Randall. You might know me as... Randy. Randy, where are you? Randy. Randy. Yeah. Hang out with Captain Q long enough, and you'll end up buying a boat. And I'm no exception. So join me as I navigate the ups and downs of owning an old sailboat. So I'm back. <laughs> it's been a long time. Somewhere in there I had COVID, uh, which was not fun to get over. Captain Q and I have been traveling all around New England. We had some sailing events. We've had a, a, lot of, a lot of things going on. I wish, probably like a lot of you, I had more hours in the day to get things done, to edit these videos, to work on the boat a little bit more. For me, this year seems like it's going to be more of a learning year. Uh, I've been trying to balance how much do I fix the boat and spend time on it and how much do I take it out and sail it. But still, every time I step on it, I'm just uh, delighted to be on it and working on it and soaking in some of the sun and the salt air, uh, jumping in for a swim. It's all pretty great. So uh, one thing I have decided to tell myself, and uh, I used to describe, oh, I've got a problem with the boat. I've got this challenge I have to fix. I'm no longer going to do that. I, mean, I think mentally it will help me shift. I'm going to call these things puzzles because really what I'm doing is trying to solve the puzzle. I'm trying to figure out the archaeology of this boat and then figure out how to solve the puzzle in the best way. Um, I think that's what boat ownership is really about. It's about the puzzles and it's about enjoying those puzzles and those things that might stretch your comfort zone a little bit. So I happen to like that. Uh, it's not for everyone, but um, I'm enjoying it so far. With that said, we have a two-part episode. Part one um, is really about winter care storage and then the splash in and commissioning. I had to break it into two because episode two covers quite a bit more of our first journey, which I will say uh, is humbling for everyone involved. So uh, you don't want to miss that one. I'm going to try to launch it next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for all the great vibes, the comments. I really appreciate it. Any feedback you have, you have thoughts about it, love to hear from you. So thanks very much. Okay, we're here at Yankee Marina in Yarmouth, Maine. I bought the boat when it was winter, so it had already been decommissioned and wrapped up for the winter. My first objective was to get on the boat, check it out, figure out what do I need to do first. So first thing that Captain Q had suggested was go take care of your batteries and make sure that they're on a trickle charger or some kind of charging. You don't want your batteries to go completely dead over winter, and in Maine that means putting them on a trickle charger, which is a slow charger. So I grabbed this one on Amazon, it, it can charge uh, four batteries at a time. I dragged an extension cord across the boat yard, plugged it in, got everything hooked up, and then this is my battery bank. Four, four six volt batteries paired, they are in series, and then the, it's basically two by two, um, if that makes sense. And where I made the mistake was I bought this charging unit um, when what I really should have done is uh, what Captain Q told me later, which is to buy what he called a pigtail. So a pigtail basically goes from your shore power input on the boat to a regular 110 outlet. At my boatyard was a 110 outlet. I thought, okay, well, um, I'll just run a 110 to the boat and make that work. Really what I should have done was run the extension cord to the pigtail. It's basically like I'm at a dock and I'm running under shore power. And then I can use charger system, which is already rigged up to charge it perfectly. So I, you know, made a mistake, quick reaction, like, oh my God, I've got to, I've got to trickle charge my batteries. Let me buy a trickle charger. The whole boat has a system already built for that. Uh, let me just buy the pigtail for 85 bucks rather than the trickle charger for 200. This is all part of the learning process for me. I can test to see what my, um, my engine battery is doing, which is great in shape. And now after I've hooked this up properly, I get a nice full charge on my, my bank of four. I have two more up in the bow that drive the bow thruster and the windlass, the electric windlass. So let's go take a look at those. I have two big 12 volt batteries here. So the problem was I got up here and I had someone else had set up this charger to trickle charge these two batteries in the front and apparently it was not connected correctly so um, it wasn't actually trickle charging it looks really complicated 
Um, I had one slight freak out moment, which is once I started the charger and got it hooked up properly, immediately I could hear something kick on and I thought, oh, this is, this is great. It's, uh, it's the, I'm, li I'm hearing the trickle charger. It wasn't because I took a, a harder listen and it was like gurgling water and it sounded like a pump was pumping water. And so I was a little freaked out. Like I'm in the boatyard. Am I just pumping something out over the side in the boatyard? So I had to quickly throw the phone down and then scramble and, and play the listening game. And what I found out was the battery must have been dead and me charging it up and bringing it back to life must have just uh, caused that pump to trigger. So maybe I'm thinking it was probably a bilge pump and there was enough water in the bilge that the, the bilge pump went off. And so it, it fired for probably 90 seconds to two minutes. Uh, and then I disconnected it a couple times because I was a little freaked out. Uh, and then once I reconnected it, it stopped. So it was uh, a little bit of a panic. Like, I don't know what I'm, what's splashing overboard. I don't want to be that guy at the boat yard. Anyway, everything turned out okay. Those batteries are in great shape. The other batteries are great right now. So the boat is wrapped in plastic. The plastic wrap is not something I'm a huge fan of. It is economical. For this boat, the raw plastic material was about five or six hundred dollars. Once you add in the labor to create the frame, I think the total expense for the year was about fifteen or sixteen hundred dollars for this for my boat. So uh, it's a forty-five foot boat. That means it's probably about thirty dollars a foot for winterizing wrap. So if you had a thirty-foot boat, maybe that's nine hundred bucks or something like that. So I don't love it because, well, you can see here that there's a, a bead in the bottom edge of it, which helps keep it secure and, and tight from getting snow up and under it. The problem with it is that, that when there's a little bit of movement due to wind and, and the pressure in this kind of wrap system, it ends up m moving about an inch or two. And that just created a bunch of scrapes in the paint finish, which I need to actually buff out. And I haven't done that yet. So I don't love it. It's, it's $1,500 a year and it creates a lot of waste and it's not very gentle on the boat. I'd much rather do something like this canvas cover. These are much more expensive. You know, these are like seven to $9,000 for a 45 foot boat. That initial investment will take, you know, four or five years before it pays off. You can see the waste that we're creating here and the, the plastic is really hard to recycle. I also like the idea of having a canvas cover that lives with the boat. Rigging up the booms, you can see uh, Captain Q being clever using the halyard to get it into place rather than having to lift the heavy boom. Using the halyard is pretty easy, makes it simple work. He's connecting up the gooseneck while I watch. I'm pretty good at watching him work. The mizzen boom went on equally as quickly. In fact, we didn't have cameras for that setup. We just rigged it up really quickly. And once the booms are on, we are pretty much ready to drop it in the water. Yankee brought over the lift and is getting it ready to put in the water. You'll notice that the pro crew at Yankee has put the straps right at the bulkhead locations of the boat. So basically when you lift the boat up, you want to support it right where the bulkheads are. And this boat has multiple bulkheads. I just highlighted a couple here that where the slings are actually set. If you don't put the slings on the bulkhead, you risk torquing the hull structure. So once lifted up in the slings, you can remove the jack stands and now it's time to cruise it over. It's pretty fun to see this lift move this 30,000 pound boat and back it up to the dock and get it ready to, to drop in. Before we ended up dropping it in, I had asked them to give me a quick power wash to remove any sediment or any kind of creatures on the bottom. Because the paint is ablating, um, this will give us a nice little fresh coat. I'd like to have that bottom as smooth as possible. realize you know it's probably a good idea if we test that centerboard out since uh, we haven't had it up in a position to be able to test it. The centerboard on the boat is uh, hydraulic and there is a an electrical hydraulic mechanism but that does not work so we have to use the hand hydraulic pump 
So we gave that a quick test, jumped on board while it's in the sling, and you can see here we are raising it using the hydraulic pump. Um, it's not terribly big, but it's enough to give you some lateral stability and great to see that works. So once that was done, it's time to drop it in and actually get it in the water. Now, because we haven't commissioned the boat, so the engine doesn't function uh, and there's all the systems are uh, moderately operational. So the, the pro team at Yankee Marina is, makes this look pretty easy, but they just tow it out into place and, and secure it. And then it's up to you to get going and get out of their hair. They got a lot of boats that they're moving in in spring and everyone's anxious to get out on the water. So it's a good neighbor policy to get out of their hair as quickly as possible. So once I'm in my rafted up position here, I roped Captain Q into come helping me out for a day or so. We decided to fill up the tanks with a little bit of bleach and cycle through a couple of fill-ups with water just to make sure we killed any organisms that might have been growing there over the winter. You can see his knee pads really come in handy here. So furnish him with knee pads and uh, he'll go to work for you. Here John is giving me a quick run through of the electrical panel. This is my first introduction to actually seeing it function, so it's still overwhelming. He then gave me a run through of some of the quirky fuel and heat exchanger. So this is the heat exchanger that he's showing me you need to switch and also the fuel line that you need to switch when you switch between engine and generator. They're not set up to be running at the same time, which makes sense. I think I don't really see the need to run both at the same time. He then took me up to the forward head to kind of give me the, a little rundown on the various valves here. This is a valve for the pump out versus the holding tank. And then the same goes for this lower valve. And I wasn't really clear on how this worked. I was still a little confused until I saw a schematic diagram as to how this functions. But it's basically to switch between holding tank, direct overboard, and pump out. The next thing up was Adam who was super helpful. Adam gave me a quick run through of the things that he thought were somewhat critical. Here we are taking a look at the propane storage in the lazarette of the aft cockpit. Um, you'll notice that the two tanks are not secured and there is a non-pressurized line, which is a no-no, that black line there on the right. You'll also see there's like a cottage cheese container or some kind of plastic container that's supposed to keep the solenoid dry because this is a relatively wet locker. So, all of these things combined, you can hear Adam's reaction here. I mean, geez, Louise. And I really heeded his advice. This is not a secure setup for multiple reasons, and you really don't want to be messing around with propane like this. So that's a pretty high priority for me to get propane safe, secure, and functioning. So uh, that's something I'm going to be doing in this off season. I haven't even set it up yet. I just dis I just disconnected it based on his advice. I thought that was a smart move. So here, Captain and Q and I rig up the mizzen. That was easy enough. Jeff gives me a hand rigging up the furling mainsail and the furling jib. Um, Jeff was really helpful in showing me how it all worked. So I really have to hand it to the Yankee guys for walking me through a lot of the systems that I'm not familiar with, and they made it look pretty easy. You'll see here, uh, there's something off the back of the boat that uh, I forgot that I needed. So I'm keeping the boat on a mooring. Yeah, I needed a way to get out there. I am headed out to go check out a dinghy. We actually spotted it when we were looking at the Trip 31 for a few episodes back. The owner of the Trip 31 had, I think two or three of them in his yard. He's gonna take it out and clean it up. It's a Dyer Dow, which is a sailing dinghy, which, um, should be pretty fun. You can row it, you can sail it, you can put a motor on it. And so short term needs, I just need something to kind of get me out to a mooring. Uh, I'm going to be keeping the boat on a mooring for this season. So I need a little get out to and from. There she is. Holy smokes, look at that dinghy. Uh, it's got the full rig. Um, a wicked big dinghy. 
That's yeah, very, yeah, very solid. Nice yeah. Thing. Yeah, so he's added a little flotation here in the aft seat yep. and then yep. in that front he came seat with as well. That originally, and there was some up here yep. too, so he's probably replaced it. Yeah. Yep, and then he's done a whole uh, new fresh epoxy and then even added a little bit of glass on the inside. So it's, uh, it's a big thing. So it's time to sail and get away from the dock and get out of the way at Yankee Marina. So we took it over to a neighboring dock, filled up the diesel tanks and headed out. I roped my nephew and his girlfriend to join us from Yarmouth and we were gonna sail down to Portland, which is only eight or 10 miles. And we headed out on one of the most beautiful summer days in Maine, just gorgeous. There might've been a few problems along the way and uh, you're going to have to tune in next week to see exactly how things went. And spoiler alert, it did not go well.